I would like to introduce to you Jim Falk. He is a Global Santa Fe board member and a full-time volunteer. <laughs> introduce our special guest. Thank you so much, Jim, over to you. Thank you, and I, you know, we really do have a lot of fun being a full-time semi-retired volunteer. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's great to see such a large crowd, and thank you for being with us. You know, Jeff, this program really fit in so perfectly because uh, last year, late last year, we started our program, Democracy Under Fire, and we had Jeremy Suri from the University of Texas at Austin. Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, your good friends, and then Richard Haas. And so when we learned about the title of your book and, and knew what you were doing, we're just so grateful that you came. And we know too, and I'll let you tell the audience why you were so intrigued and wanted to come to Santa Fe to break a record. Uh, break a record, yeah. Um, <laughs> because I want to be, I, uh, Jim told me about 2102. <laughs> two people. $10 million house, two weeks a year. Uh, that, that's, that, that's my goal now for, for Santa Fe. And you're kind uh, not to say I, that those I, are Texans. I, I have a wife and I have two weeks a year. It's the $10 million house that's, uh, um, you know, I that's need to figure that out. Um, I, I, this morning, I had visited a total of 47 states in the United States South Dakota, North Dakota, and New Mexico were not on the list. And how could that be? How could that be? Well, it's now 48. Um, so I'm very, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And, uh, and uh, all I need now is the $10 million house. So, uh, we're, we're, uh, good. Well, we're going to sell enough books tonight, yeah, thanks right. to collected work. Some of you may have to buy more than one, I'm afraid. So, that's so great. you know, several years ago, I had the privilege of talking with Doris Kearns Goodwin. And she always talked about how she felt when she was writing about Lyndon Johnson or Abraham, particularly Abraham Lincoln, that she felt that she was living with them. And she enjoyed that. On the other hand, <laughs> you, when you write about Patty Hearst and uh, Donald Trump, and now Timothy McVeigh. It doesn't sound like it's much fun, but truly, the books that you've written are just you know fascinating, really well researched, and you know people do, will have the opportunity to purchase um, Homegrown tonight. But I also want to encourage everyone to read about what the Supreme Court used to be with the Oath and the Nine, two tremendous books that you wrote. So with that. Welcome, my friend. It's good to see well, you. Well, thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. So almost every interview starts with this question, and it's hard not to start with the same one. But you know, it's hard to believe, but it's really been two decades since the Oklahoma City bombing and two decades since he was executed. Um, what led you to write this book, especially at this time? Um, well, as my dad used to say, to make a long story unbearable, um, <laughs> um, my, uh, ment one of my mentors in journalism was Michael Kinsley. And he said um, there were only two stories ever worth writing. Uh, one is everything you thought you knew is wrong. And the other is it's worse than you think. And both of which uh, apply to this story. Uh, apply to this story. I covered. Um, I didn't cover the bombing itself in 1995. The bombing was April 19, 1995. Uh, but the trial was uh, moved to Denver, and it took place in 1997. The the, the trials of Timothy McVeigh and uh, Terry Nichols were were severed. There were two trials, and I covered both of those. Um, for, um, for ABC, where, where I was working at the time in The New Yorker. And uh, so I, I was very familiar with the case. Um, but you know, it had, been, it had been a long time. But what really brought me back was, as you may remember, in October of 2020, the FBI arrested a number of people in Michigan who were charged with conspiring to kidnap Governor Whitmer there. Yes. And I got very interested in that case, and I saw that several of them were affiliated with the Michigan militia. I knew that Terry Nichols 
um, the co-defendant in the Oklahoma City bombing was also from Michigan, and he was affiliated with the Michigan militia. And I started looking into it, and, and, and I saw that not only was the ideological profile similar of the, the would-be kidnappers and, and uh, Nichols, but also um, some of the exact same people um, were, were, were involved. It was only a few weeks later that January 6th happened. And again, I saw the ideological similarities between McVeigh, Nichols, and um, the, people, the people who stormed the Capitol. At that point, I decided you know, maybe it was worth a new look at the, at, um, at the story of the Oklahoma City bombing. There's never really been a book about the Oklahoma City bombing that, 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 that was widely read. And the opportunity to tell, which is really an amazing sort of true crime story about how the bombing happened, and see all the connections between that act and the subsequent right-wing extremists and, and violence, that was, the, that was what drew me back to the story. You know, one of the things that I found so interesting, as well as disturbing in the book, was that Timothy McVeigh could have, might have had a very successful career in the military. And you know, I'd forgotten that he had served, you know, frankly with some distinction in the first Iraq war. Talk about that and what happened. Well, the, um, the, the, you know, w one of the things that, that is so striking about both McVeigh and Nichols is the ordinariness of, of their background. Um, and um, it, it just let's talk about uh, McVeigh, uh, since you raise it. Uh, McVeigh grew up outside um, Buffalo, New York in a town called Lockport, where his father worked for 30 years in a GM plant there. His grandfather worked at the same GM plant for 30 years. Um, that plant was shrinking almost to insignificance to, um, by the time um, Nichols came of age, and it was not an option for him. So there was this economic dislocation. N Nichols had a similar scenario in Michigan with the decline of his family's family farm. So there was this economic uncertainty for both of them. Uh, McVeigh uh, became, at a very early age, obsessed with guns. Um, he, he joined the NRA early. He, he started reading the ads in the back. He, he read uh, a novel. Um, that he got through mail order called the Turner Diaries, which will probably yeah. come up again in our conversation, which started to bring him into uh, right-wing uh, extremist thought. He then, um, after college, I mean, after high school, um, he sort of flunked out of, uh, of a junior college he went to for a while. And like a lot of people who didn't, um, you know, know, know what to do and who like to shoot guns, he, he joined the army. Um, and um, I mean, as you said, Jim, he was a, he was a successful soldier for a time. Um, he, he joined in the, in, in the late 80s and uh, won a bronze star in the very brief um, first Gulf War and came back and tried to join the Green Berets. He went to try out for the Green Berets um, in Fort Bragg, um, is it Fort Bragg? I think it's yeah. Fort Bragg. Yeah. Um, in uh, in Georgia, no, North, Carolina. North, North Carolina. Carolina, North Carolina. Thank Fort, you. Which is now, which is now called Fort Liberty. Fort, Fort Liberty. Yes. It, unless Ron DeSantis becomes president, where he will change it back. No, that's not. True. That, that's part of his campaign plan. Yeah, it's going to be Fort Bragg again. Um, and and. Uh, McVeigh flunked out of, of the Special Forces, the Green Beret training, after two days of a 21-day tryout. And that was really a major turning point in his life, because at that point, he was really kind of a lost soul, because he wanted to advance in the Army, but he saw no, no route ahead. And it was at that point he started um, you know, getting into full-time right-wing extremism. And you know, we don't know what might have happened, but in a sense, the cards were stacked against him when he tried out for the Green Berets. 
Well, it's because he um, came, he, he basically flew back from Kuwait and didn't take any time off to, to recover his equilibrium, his health. And, and so he, he didn't have the physical stamina to go through with the test, but he didn't, and, and that's what, what happened. So this is probably a, a, a somewhat of a controversial subject, but when you Oh, then look, I probably no. shouldn't discuss it. <laughs> when, 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 when you, in your research, when you go back to what was occurring at Fort Bragg, was there a cadre, a core of ultra-right um, you know, potential um, Terrorist. Well, Jim, you know, this is a controversial subject. And, yeah, uh, that's good. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one of the things you learn when you get involved in studying right wing extremism is a lot, a, a, not a lot, a disproportionate number of the people who get arrested, who are involved, are either active duty military or, um, uh, or veterans. Now, it, it needs to be said. The vast majority of people who are veterans are wonderful law-abiding citizens. However, there is this um, disproportionate number who either joined the military because they thought that was a way of acting out their right-wing you know, views or um, were radicalized in the army. And I think McVeigh fits both of those profiles. I mean, he, he, he wanted uh, to be, uh, you know, he, he, he was already um, very clearly a right winger when he joined the army, but particularly when he served in Fort Riley in Kansas, which is a, a very, um, you know, people talk about the Oklahoma City bombing it had almost nothing to do with Oklahoma City except as the target. McVeigh had no connections to Oklahoma City. He, he lived to the extent he lived in any one place um, in north central Kansas, and that's where Terry Nichols had settled. That's where most of the planning took place because they had been stationed in Fort Riley, which is the, where the first, uh, um, the, 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 the first Army Division, the Big Red One, uh, is headquartered there. And that was a very racially and politically polarized base. And McVeigh's politics were radicalized while he was there. And he saw himself, in a sense, as a patriot, but had such deep-seated anger towards the federal government. Where did that come from? Well, th this is where um, you know, Kinsley's law, everything you thought you knew is wrong, comes in. Because to the extent Tim McVeigh is remembered at all. The two phrases you hear about him most often, at least in my experience, is lone wolf and anti-government. He was like an anti-government extremist. Both of those phrases fundamentally are wrong. He was not a lone wolf. He was part of the right-wing movement of the 1990s. He traveled around the, um, the, um, uh, the country on these very long drives to, to plan the bombing. Uh, he would drive from upstate New York to, uh, to Kansas, to, to uh, Arizona, where his friend Mike Fortier lived, to Arkansas, where another, I mean, these incredibly long drives. And the one thing that he always did was listen to three hours of Rush Limbaugh every day. And he, um, and, and when Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols um, did target practice in the fields of, of Kansas. Um, they, they would buy these silhouettes and they would paste Hillary Clinton's pic, uh, face to the, to the top of them. So this was not an anti-government person in the sense that he was some sort of anarchist or that he was a lone wolf in the sense that um, um, the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski was actually a lone wolf. And there are several, and in fact, both of those stories were unfolding at the same time. And in the historical memory, the two of them are often associated, but that's a misleading association. Because Kaczynski, as I'm sure many of you know, was, you know, was living in his cabin, coming up with these eccentric, to say the least, theories, writing his, his manifesto. He was a lone wolf. Um, um, McVeigh was a part of a movement. Now, he did not have 
uh, the ability to recruit other members, even though he wanted to. One of the things he said to his lawyers is, I knew there was an army out there, but I couldn't find him. And he would go to gun shows, and he would try to meet people, but he didn't have the personality or the ability uh, to, to, to meet other people. And the big difference between Tim McVeigh and his successors is the internet and social media. And when you look at the right-wing extremism today, it, it is it, it, the, the key factor, if you look at you know, the, the Michigan, the, you know, the attempt to ki kidnap Governor Whitmer, which was planned over Facebook private chats, or the, the, you know, the, the mass shootings, you know, the Walmart, the, the Walmart in El Paso, the synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, the, the, the church in South Carolina, the grocery store in Buffalo, all of those are radicalized on the internet. McVeigh didn't have that. But it doesn't mean he wasn't attempting to be part, of, but, but to, to find others. It's just that he didn't have the technology to, to find people. How many of you have heard of the Turner Diaries? Let's see a show of hands. Yeah, that's, oh, it's that's about a, a third. Lot. So you know, I, I had not heard of it. Fortunately, it was not on my summer reading list. <laughs> tell, tell us about it and the in, impact it had on him. Enormous, enormous. Um, the Turner Diaries is a novel. Uh, on, on the cover, it says Andrew McDonald is the author. The actual author was a guy named William Pierce, who was a neo-Nazi uh, leader in the, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s. And the book was sold mostly through mail order uh, in the 70s and 80s. And, and, and the story, the novel, is um, the, the conceit of the book is the government, the federal government, has been taken over by an evil cabal of blacks and Jews. And the first thing they do is they pass a law called the Cohen Act. It's very subtle. Uh, which calls for the confiscation of all private firearms. Guns, you know, the, the fear that the federal government will take your guns away is the central political fear of Tim McVeigh's life. And that, that comes in part from the Turner Diaries. Earl Turner, who is the narrator of, of the Turner Diaries, um, leads a rebellion against the evil federal government. And the first thing he does to um, start this rebellion is he rents a truck, fills it with a fertilizer bomb, pulls up to the FBI building in Washington, and sets it off. It is precisely to imitate that that Tim McVeigh decided to set off a bomb in the federal building. Because in the novel, the thing that happens is um, the, 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 the country rallies to Turner's side, and there becomes this, this, this um, uh, civil war that is ultimately won by the white people against the blacks and Jews. And um, they, they, they retake the country. That's why McVeigh set off a bomb. That's what he hoped to accomplish. And, and um, that, that, the, the Turner Diaries was read by the Oath Keepers and a lot of the January 6th people. In fact, Amazon belatedly, after January 6th, stopped selling it. Uh, but you know, and, and it's you know it's it, it's 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 not impossible to get. You can get it off used book sales, but it, it's uh, it, it's a little harder to get now than it than it was. And you can see also that you draw a line to Charlottesville from the uh, a, absolutely, a, absolutely. You know the the uh, um, you know the the, the anti-Semitism of you know Jews will not replace us, and. Um, you know that 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 movement, that, those people who were chanting with their torches, are the linear descendants of of McVeigh and Nichols. You know the other thing that surprised me about him it was his endurance in, in, in an automobile. I mean, he just drove across the country, and he did go to Waco. Um, talk about how that whole situation in Waco. And again, you know, radicalized him. You know, th this is this is again uh, a, a part of the story that 
is partially, is partially correct. The bombing, as I said, was April 19, 1995. McVeigh planned it for April 19th because it was the second anniversary of the, um, <coughs> of the uh, terrible FBI raid on, on, at, at, um, at, at Waco, uh, the Branch Davidian compound, which, which, which you know, burned down, 76 people were killed. Um, it, it's, and, and McVeigh, um, this was um, a, a symbol to McVeigh of how evil Bill Clinton's federal government was. I mean, again, the, the point I want to make is that you know, Tim McVeigh was not against all government or all federal government. He was against Bill Clinton's federal government. I mean, yes. that's, that, that is an important distinction to draw. But it is also important to point out a different date, not just April, April 19th, which is September 14th, 1994. That was the day that Bill Clinton signed the assault weapons ban. And that was the, 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 the act that sealed McVeigh and Nichols' decision to go ahead with the bombing plan. So, you know, a, a lot of people, um, to the extent they remember you know, the, the Oklahoma City bombing, they oh, always like a protest against Waco. That was only part of the story. The assault weapons ban, that was as much a motivation for McVeigh as, as was his outrage about Waco. And the assault weapons ban, of course, to McVeigh was the beginning of what would ultimately become the Cohen Act. You know, when we look at the bombing and we think back to 9-11, people always said, if you just connected the dots, were there opportunities that people might have been able to see what he was planning, other than the fact that he told two of, not necessarily accomplice, but two people did know that he was planning. But were there other instances where someone might have been able to raise a flag and say, hey, this guy is really dangerous? You know, <clears throat> not much, not much. I mean, the, he, he operated very much uh, but beneath the radar. I mean, he, you know, one of the stories here, and I wanna be very careful in, in how I phrase this, is that McVeigh was kind of a genius. I mean, this was, I mean, he was an evil genius. But to pull this off and keep it secret uh, for as long as he did, um, you know, buying fertilizer, you know, he bought fertilizer in farm stores in Kansas. People buy a lot of fertilizer in, in farm stores in Kansas. That's why they sell it there. Uh, and, and so it was not in and of itself suspicious. There was one moment it, where, um, you know, he, the, 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 he, he, he recognized that, you know, farmers, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I don't know a lot about farming. Uh, but, you know, farmers blow up stumps frequently on their land and they use, uh, they, they can make explosives out of fertilizer and diesel fuel. That's, it's a fairly common, common thing. McVeigh um, did research and he saw that if you use jet fuel, like, ra like racing car fuel, rather than diesel, you'd get a bigger explosion. So he needed to buy racing fuel. At one point in one of these long drives across the country, he goes to, uh, to a, a drag race track outside of um, Tulsa and tries to buy three barrels of racing fuel. And the owner gets suspicious. And McVeigh sort of freaks, you know, picks up the vibe and leaves. He actually, the, the owner calls the B B Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and says, you know, this guy was trying to buy racing fuel. And that was somewhat suspicious. I can't blame BATF. What were they supposed to do? That he didn't have a name. Yeah. He didn't have, uh, you know, a, a license plate. I mean, it th was not. It was not like the, the first World Trade Center bombing, where there really were a lot of mix, mixed uh, signals. You know, McVeigh was very good at being a terrorist, and and you know, he almost got away with it. So. Stephen Jones, 
uh, was his attorney, the lead attorney for most of the time, and you were given access, I guess anyone can go to the library, but what, a million? But I got there first. <laughs> and a million, what are there, a million documents? Right. So, you know, I was talking to an attorney friend and he said, you know, that still bothers me that um, Stephen Jones gave those papers to the University of Texas. Uh, you graduated from Harvard, magna cum laude. Did, did it in any way offer you some concern that one, not that you were able to see it, but that Stephen Jones gave those papers to the university? Um, because I am a terrible person, I was so thrilled uh, <laughs> that he did this. It does make the uh, book. <laughs> no, no, but, but I mean, just to, to give you the, the, the full story, you know, Stephen Jones was the, the, the lead lawyer uh, for McVeigh, and um, he, were, the, the, I don't know how many of you were football fans of the 1980s, uh, George Allen, uh, was uh, was a famous fo Washington Redskins football coach, and the the famous line that the owner said about him was, uh, "I gave him an unlimited budget, and he exceeded it." Uh, <laughs> Stephen Jones was given an unlimited budget by the federal government to defend Timothy McVeigh, and he exceeded it. He there were like twenty, there were literally uh, m between fifteen and twenty lawyers who were on private investigators, world travel. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. All of that led to 635 boxes worth of material, <laughs> including records of all of the interviews that McVeigh did with his lawyers, all of the memos that they wrote about their legal strategy, all of the letters that McVeigh wrote to his lawyers, all of the discovery that the federal government turned over to Stephen Jones, the FBI records called 302s, all their interviews. It's about a million documents. I don't think you have, I mean, it's nice that I have a fancy law degree. I don't think you have to have a fancy law degree to know that attorneys are not supposed to say what their clients said to them, especially when they're <laughs> confessing to mass murder. Jeff, when were the papers uh, given to UT? Um, it, right around the time he was executed, right, right, you know, late 90s, I mean, before he was executed, so actually. So did, did, yeah. did McVeigh know? That's a good question. I don't know. McVeigh was executed in 2001. Um, and, 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 and anyway, I mean, it really is kind of shocking. And, and it's, it's, you might say, well, McVeigh was dead. It's well known that the attorney-client privilege survives the death of the client. And um, a, a lot of lawyers, understandably, think it's outrageous that, that, Mc, that um, uh, Jones did this, and he tried to take a three hundred thousand dollar tax deduction, which was disallowed <laughs> by the by by the IRS. Um, but you know, I am someone who has basically spent the last thirty years covering criminal investigations, criminal trials. You know, I've written books about O.J. Simpson, Patty Hearst. Um, you know, the Mueller investigation. You never get to see this stuff, and you know. It was gold. It was unbelievable, you know, to get to see all of how the federal government did their investigation and all of how McVeigh um, was defended. And Jones, to, to, you know, to defend him a little bit, you know, he, he wrote about this in the paperback version of a book he wrote about the case. And he said, uh, quoting a f famous Felix Frankfurter line, history too has its claims. And that, that, you know, this is important and someone should, you know, and someone, you know, that, that, that story should be told. And I am somewhat sympathetic to that view. I obviously took advantage of it. And so I don't, you know, I don't want to seem too churlish in, in criticizing. And you, and you wrote a hell of a good book from well, it. Well, <laughs> that too, I hope. So did McVeigh want to be acquitted? Did, and and it rolled into that question is, how did he and his attorney differ on how he should be defended? You know, it, it, that, that's actually a great question because of how weird this trial was. Um, I mean, usually the answer is, does the defendant want to be acquitted? Yes, he does. End of story. That's sort of how, why criminal defense lawyers do their jobs. 
what was different about this was that the moment Stephen Jones represent, started representing McVeigh, he said, I did it, and I am proud that I did it. And, and you know, I did it. For and I want people reason. to know it. And, and, and well, he, he, he wanted it known that it was done for the reasons that it was done. He, he was somewhat ambivalent about he, how much of his own role he wanted uh, he, he, he wanted known. And, and in fairness to Jones, it's not an easy thing to defend someone who is proudly guilty but wants to be defended anyway. And um, it led to a lot of conflict between Jones and, and McVeigh. Um, Jones became obsessed with the idea and is to this day that McVeigh was part of a broader conspiracy, but wouldn't admit it. And that's why Jones traveled all around. You know, and, and he, you know, is like a right wing conspiracy or a Muslim conspiracy, none of which I am convinced is true. I believe that the government was right. This was just McVeigh and Nichols. Um, but at one point in the defense, McVeigh said, I want, um, um, I, 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 there is this defense he learned called necessity, mm -hmm. that I had to do it. That it that, that, and, and, and this comes up, I mean, the, 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 it's very rare that it comes up, but, but there's this case in uh, South Carolina where a guy is at home with his wife, she is having some medical crisis, he then speeds and drives without a license to the doctor to try to you know, get her some help. His conviction is overturned because he had a necessity to, to, to break the law. McVeigh said, well, because of the federal government's evil behavior at Waco, I was required to blow up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. This was to use a technical legal term, idiotic. <laughs> uh, and, and Jones, they, they actually researched this, but I mean, he couldn't, I mean, you just couldn't argue that in court. So they wound up just, uh, the defense was sort of, well, you know, the, there was reasonable doubt, the evidence wasn't, you know, clearly pointing to him. But, you know, frankly, with McVeigh, it was an open and shut case. Another character in the book, and someone you were able to interview, of course, is the current Attorney General, Merrick Garland. And as you explain in the book, you can see an awful lot of his character as it came out during the time of the Oklahoma City bombing. Again, one of, one of the fun things about writing relatively recent history like this, and this came up um, when I was writing about the Patty Hearst case, which was 20 years ver earlier in the 70s, is you tend to forget stuff that was happening at the same time. The Oklahoma City bombing was April 1995. January 1995 was the start of the O.J. Simpson criminal trial. And um, this well, I, easy for me to remember because I was covering the O.J. Simpson criminal trial when the Oklahoma City bombing case happened. Um, this was a national obsession. I know, I can tell from looking around the, the room, no one here is old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson case. <laughs> but for, for those of you, for those of you who, who, you know, like write about it in books and stuff, he was a football star. In the anyway. Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, the Encyclopedia Britannica, yeah. <laughs> anyway, there was like, uh, there was like Cato Kalin, there was a whole thing. Anyway, um, it was a national obsession. The lawyers were celebrities. There were lots of jokes about it. The, the Jay Leno made, you know, there were the dancing Edos on television. Um, Merrick Garland was a senior, but not top senior, uh, uh, Justice Department official at the time. He, he was the principal aide to the Deputy Attorney General, um, who sent McVeigh, who sent Garland to Oklahoma City to supervise the investigation. Garland who was the legal star of his generation. 
you know, summa cum laude from Harvard, Harvard Law Review, clerked on the Supreme Court for William Brennan, um, was appalled at the O.J. Simpson case, was horrified at the way the, 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 it was a media circus, and he was determined in supervising the, the Oklahoma City bombing that it would be the opposite of the O.J. Simpson case. And when he named, mm. when he picked the lawyers, he wanted low profile Midwestern lawyers who would not give interviews, who would not call attention to themselves, who would try to try a narrow, fast case, you know, not get bogged down, not talk about politics, and it was successful. However, it was a little misleading about what was really going on. By turning this into a just a case about the bombing and not really talking about his motivations, mm. it gave the public a somewhat misleading picture uh, of the case. Fast forwarding to his tenure as attorney general, what you see is extreme caution about publicity again. And his great reluctance to talk about, now in, in fairness, he has supervised an extremely um, um, thorough investigation of the January 6th investigation. And we now know that the, the president who has, has, has received a target letter in connection with the investigation, so it's a, he is likely to be indicted. You know, Garland also uh, has used, uh, you know, he, super, he, he approved the search of Mar-a-Lago, the case against Trump in Mar-a-Lago. So I don't think you can accuse Garland of cowardice in terms of how he has con led this investigation. However, he has been extremely reluctant to talk about the larger theories, the, the larger motivations uh, behind what was going on in, in terms of the right-wing extremist movement of, 2020, of the 2020s. And that, I think, you can trace to his, 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 his um, feelings about the O.J. Simpson case. On the other side of the coin, President Clinton just was chomping at the bit. See, this to me was one of the most interesting things I, I learned. Um, Bill Clinton was president in April of 1995. How many people remember Bill Clinton? Han no, I, I, know, I know you remember Clinton. I, 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 um, um, when I, w one of the things that, that you may remember is the day of the bombing, a lot of people, including people in the media, started saying this was the work of Islamic extremists because it had just been two years since the first World Trade Center bombing, which was the work of Islamic extremists. And um, there was a lot of speculation to that effect. Clinton, in public, didn't say anything about how we thought he did it. He, of course, said, you know, we feel sympathy. We want a full and thorough investigation. You know, he, he said all the appropriate things. But in private, I learned, um, he, he, in the Oval Office with his aides, the aides were saying, oh, this might be Islamic extremists. And Clinton said, this wasn't Islam. This was the militias. I know, I know these people. I don't think, how did he know? How did he know? So fast forward to 2022, I interview Bill Clinton, and I say, how did you know? And he said, I knew them from Arkansas. And he then gave me chapter and verse of how much he had dealt with right-wing militias and, and their affiliates in Arkansas. And it was amazing the number of murders, including murders of state troopers, murders of a sheriff in northern Arkansas who had been Clinton's county campaign coordinator. In that, I mean, it was, and and of course, you know, he and, and you know he was doing this almost 40 years later. And I then, of course, fact checked him about well, and it it was amazing how how accurate it was, and and he gave a series of speeches after the Oklahoma City bombing where he was talking about how um, political uh, viol violent speech, including on the radio, 
can motivate uh, actual violence. And Rush Limbaugh and Gordon Liddy, who were the sort of big figures at the moment, they were all wounded innocents. Oh, how could he accuse us? Clinton, of course, didn't know how right he was. And it was only when I started looking through these papers when I saw what a ditto head um, uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, 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 McVeigh was. Um, and, and, but Clinton understood the political context of this bombing immediately and much better than Garland did and talked about it in a very different way than Garland did and has talked about it. And I thought that was a, an important distinction to draw. Before we open it up, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening now. Jeff, I was talking to a friend and told him the title of your book, and he said, oh, it's always the right wing. You know, and in your epilogue, you talk about the, the percentage of violence that comes from the ultra-right versus the left, and interpretation of the Second Amendment, acceptance of violence, and I wonder if you might, you know, elaborate on that somewhat. You know, the 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 the, the false equivalence is is one of the banes of the news media's existence in my in my experience. Because when you talk about political violence in this country, the first thing that that comes up, and you know, there was a great moment in the first debate between um, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, where. Um, Biden raised the issue of um, the Oath Keepers and their plans for violence. And Trump said, the real violence in this country comes from Antifa, which is a, a left, you know, Antifa. And, and to this day, um, you hear on Fox News and elsewhere that Antifa is, is the real uh, threat. And, and they, were, you know, le they were involved in 9-11 as agents provocateurs. You know, what they did in Portland is equivalent. If you look at the facts, about 75% of the political violence in this country comes from the right wing. About, and, and the rest is, is roughly evenly divided between Islamic radicalism and left wing radicalism. It is overwhelmingly a right wing issue in this country, especially when it comes to mass violence. You know, I, I mentioned you know, the, the mass shootings. And the difference now, the difference is McVeigh was operating in a world where you couldn't buy an AR-15 because of the assault weapons ban. But the assault weapons ban was only for 10 years, and it, and it expired. If you look at the mass shootings, they didn't have to go to all that trouble of building a bomb. You just go and buy an assault weapon and shoot up a synagogue or shoot up a church or shoot up um, you know, a, a, a Walmart. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on now. And the threat is overwhelmingly from the right rather than the left. Talk about how, and I guess uh, 2009, the Department of Homeland Security's report uh, titled Current uh, Right Wing Extremism, Current Economic and Political Climate Fueling Resurgence and Radicalization Recruitment was squashed. A, 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 a nearly forgotten moment from the early Obama administration. The, Bush, the George W. Bush administration, Department of Homeland Security, you know, they do threat assessments. They, you know, that's something the Department of Homeland Security did. They commissioned a report of, about the threat of right-wing violence. Um, the, the Department of Homeland Security in April of 2009, so just three months into Obama's term, came out with a report that said the right-wing violence is, um, is, is a threat, particularly when you have a lot of returning veterans from a war in the Middle East, like, for example, Timothy McVeigh in, in 1995. Well, this report comes out in, in April of 1995, and Republicans in Congress go nuts. They say, you're trying to you know, disparage our veterans. You're trying to paint all conservatives as terrorists. This is outrageous. This is unfair. And Janet Napolitano, who was the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security at the time, surrenders immediately and says, my bad. We're withdrawing the report. 
The, you know, this was not, and, and they stopped investigating the right wing violence. Um, now, this comes after 9-11. I mean, remember, 1995 is, is the Oklahoma City bombing, 2001 is 9-11. 9-11 is, of course, genuinely an Islamic radical plot. It is, um, it, but, but what it comes to, to represent as all terrorism, and, and there is a very conscious attempt to read right-wing terrorism out of the book of history after 9-11. And in fact, there, there were attempts, including a congressional report uh, led by a, a Republican congressman named Dana War Rohrabacher, uh, to, to try to tie McVeigh and Nichols to, right, to, to Islamic radicalism. Hmm. Crazy time stuff, not true, but it, it served a political purpose by trying to pretend that all terrorism was Islamic, or in later terms, Antifa, when in fact the, the major threat has been from the right all along. Well, let's, let's hear from you. And what I'm going to ask, with due respect, that your questions start with what, where, when, why, how, and that they be relatively short. Molly will uh, hold the mic. And we have two mics. Uh, we got this question in the back. So you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that Timothy McVeigh and Nichols both lost their uh, jobs in terms of their right uh, to work at the factory and the farm. And I was wondering if you could speak to the relative deprivation of the right wing movement in general. Well, you know, that, that's, a really, that's, a, that's a really great <laughs> question because, you know, McVeigh and Nichols were not, you know, angry proletariats. They were not. Um, you know, uh, you know, revolutionaries who you know who, who who were poor and you know struggling to survive. I mean, one reason the picture on the cover of of Homegrown is it's the house where McVeigh grew up. It's a nice middle class house, and he had a middle class life. The and and one of the one of the struggles in writing a book like this is obviously a question you want to ask is like why did he do it. Well, you know, he, he had a loss of economic security. You know, his parents had an ugly divorce. He was in the army. He listened to Rush Limbaugh. That describes about 50 million people in the United States, <laughs> the vast majority of whom are, are perfectly law-abiding citizens. So it, it's hard to point to anything in particular. I guess, you know, one, one, one um, quality that is common uh, among um, right-wing violence in particular is loss of status and the fear of loss of status. That it, it's one thing um, where, where, you know, a poor person, you know, kill, you know, fights to get rich. But that's actually not all that common in terms of political violence. What's more common is people who fear loss of status and you know who fear that you know the the that you know the black people are going to get ahead of them and the immigrants are going to get ahead of them and the women are going to get ahead of them um, that um, there's a wonder, there's a wonderful book by Arlene Hochschild about uh, Louisiana um, where um, you know like a like why 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 this group of people you know be, became so right wing when in fact they were um, you know the, the government had actually helped them and and it was the fear that you know black people were jumping the line that they were getting advantages that they weren't getting so I think it's the loss of the fear of loss of status is 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 really the, uh, a big motivator here. Molly, let's take a question in the front. So following up on that and having read the book, how much of the outlaw mentality that is embedded in the American DNA factored into Timothy McVeigh's thinking? I was immediately struck by this idea of him driving thousands of miles 
which is what was always said about Clyde Barron in the 1930s. Somebody could outrun the police. He was very smart about knowing the rules. How much of that, which is so much a part of our Southwestern history, really affected his thinking? Well, let, let me um, refer to another uh, uh, book. The, the book that won the Pulitzer Prize for history this year uh, was by a professor from Tulane named Je uh, Jefferson Cowie. And the book is called Freedom's Dominion. And it's about a county in Alabama. Um, it happens to be the county where George Wallace is from. Um, and it's the history of anger against the federal government as a vehicle for reaction. That, you know, the federal government, you know, it, it, it ended slavery, fought the Civil War, tried to give blacks some economic opportunity and reconstruction. Um, um, later, of course, tried to, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Johnson administration, the, the Great Society. The, the idea that the federal government was a force, uh, was an outside evil force uh, that um, was taking away the rights of good Americans is deeply embedded in American life. And, and Cowie's book um, really goes, goes way back. You know, when I was talking with my publisher, Simon & Schuster, um, one, um, I guess I, I <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, my original subtitle for the book was <laughs> How Timothy McVeigh Tried to Make America Great Again. <laughs> <laughs> they thought that was a little, on, as we say in Hollywood, was a little on the nose. Uh, and, and they said, oh, we want to like, try to broaden it a little bit. And, and, they, and, and they said, well, we got Timothy McVeigh and the birth of right-wing extremism. And I said, no, 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 it wasn't the birth. This goes, I mean, you know, depending on when you count, I mean, it goes back to, you know, the, the importation of slaves in this country starting in, the, you know, 1619. So, so um, you know, it, 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 Timothy McVeigh was not the first and he was not the last. So you could start counting. And, and start this story at any point. And that's why I mentioned the, the Cowie book, which is so wonderful, because it, ha it has a historical sweep that, that my book doesn't, doesn't attempt. Christian, let's get one in the back, and then we'll get Ambassador Esquino. My question is going to be brief, and then I'm going to follow up with why I'm asking it. Did you, do you, to what extent do you have a sense that McVeigh is being viewed as a martyr and a hero today? And I'm asking that, given that uh, I was in Oklahoma City, and my daughter and son-in-law still live there. They're both paramedics. They worked the bombing. They don't go there, but we went to a restaurant close to the memorial, and there's this big chain link fence. You may have looked at it, uh, with lots of mementos, teddy bears, flowers, pictures, notes. And I commented about how you know, after 20 some years later, people are still putting up a lot of mementos. And they said, yes, and not all of them are for the people who died in the bombing. Uh, the, now, and is he being viewed as a martyr and a hero? And you were just in Oklahoma City recently, and did you get a sense of what's oh, happening? Oh, I, I, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Oklahoma City for this book, so it wasn't just, you know. And, and, and the answer to your question is no for the most part, is that you know, there are some really extreme crazies, and I talk about this a little in, at the end of the book, um, who, who, you know, who look at McVeigh a, as a hero. But that's a very small number of people. It, and, and that's, but, but the thing that, and, and, the, and, and if you ask the Oath Keepers, you know, do you view McVeigh as a hero? They say, of course not. We're, we're not like McVeigh at all. And the point, the point is they don't admit how much they are like McVeigh. So it's not that they are, that they are you know, saying, well, we want to you know, kill 168 people too. But what they don't acknowledge is they 
are obsessed with this crazy fear that the federal government is going to take their guns away. They believe that you can use violence against the federal government. They have this crazy view of the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers and the Constitution that gives them um, the, the license to, to engage in this kind of violence. And that's what the prologue of, of my book is about, because McVeigh you know, had memorized large parts of the Declaration of Independence, not just the famous part at the beginning, we hold these truths to be self-evident, but the part where they justify the rebellion against the British, and that was being quoted on January 6th as well. And that's what the prologue of my book is about. So, so no, they don't, um, they don't idolize McVeigh, but they don't recognize how similar they are to him. Ambassador? I'm fascinated about Terry Nichols because as you um, point out in the book, he is so different from McVeigh. And when you're writing the book, you try to interview him. He refuses. He's in a supermax. And my, my question is, thinking about Wesley Van Houten, who has just gotten out, who was part of the uh, Manson crew after 50 years in jail, will Terry Nichols ever show any remorse? Uh, he seems to have just disappeared in a way, and yet he was a major pr protagonist in, in this story. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> Their, their first personalities were very were, were very different, and uh, they met on the first day of basic training, um, and in in, in, um, in 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 the army, um, and um, I, McVeigh was, as I said, had this kind of evil genius and evil charisma, and I don't believe. There is any possibility if if Terry Nichols left to his own devices would have bombed the Murrah building. He didn't have the intelligence. He didn't have the energy. He didn't have the the intel the the the, the skills. But you know he was a follower. Um, he he was much more clearly than McVeigh a loser in life. And I, I won't tell you all about it, you know, you, it's, it's in the book, you know, he, he gets dumped by his wife, he goes to the Philippines to get a, a mail order bride who, you know, I mean, he, you know, a woman he could, he thought he could dominate. Um, he, he's locked away in, in, in the Supermax in Colorado. I, you know, I, he, 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 I mean, yes, I tried to interview him. But I don't think he would have had anything much interesting to say. He never had anything interesting to say, as far as I could tell, throughout his life. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, just out of due diligence as a reporter, of course, I tried to interview him. But I don't, I don't think I missed a lot. We have time for two more questions. Do we have another one in the? Yes, sir. If you'll just wait for the microphone. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is. What do you think is the best way to fight right-wing extremism? And as a related question, do you see any optimism for education to really have an impact? That's a great question. As I've been talking about um, homegrown, I've been asked this frequently. It's like, what can we do about it? And my answer is, it beats the hell out of me. Um, I, I mean, I'm serious. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, you know, these ideas are out there. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot, I, you know, social media has tried to engage in some sort of content regulation. And that's become hugely contra controversial, as you know. Um, you know, and, and, and as I said, if you look at you know, economic uncertainty, uh, parental divorce, um, service in the army, I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of people. And, and I, I uh, you know, obviously, you want to educate people in, in civilized ways. But I don't, I don't know. Um, what what the best way to regu to to convince people um, to to behave otherwise and and you know I don't know how to regulate the internet 
uh, prop, you know, in, in, a, in a meaningful way that is consistent with you know, the values that we, we care about in this you know, freedom of speech values. So I, I really hope that's an encouraging answer for you. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's hear from Ambassador uh, Huddleston. And did I see another question over there? I thank you very much for coming. I want to put an international spin on it or ask you about it, because we're talking about internet. We're talking about the fact nationalism, prejudice, uh, economic uncertainty, uh, rapid communication. So this is all over the world. These movements are all over the world. So what can we look forward to? <laughs> uh, and then, Jeff, we'll before you answer that, let's, let's hear from you, sir, if you have a question, and we'll combine them. Will you take the mic? I have a second question, though. Okay, go ahead. All right. uh, we'll do three, and I'll do three at once. Uh, just give us your, uh, your uh, guess on the outcome of the Trump trial. <laughs> oh. Those are sort of unrelated, but that's okay. I, 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 I'll just do them one after the other. What do you okay. expect from an ambassador? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay. we'll wait, you'll get the next one. Go ahead. Okay. All right. In terms of international, I mean, you know, I, I've now started to read the literature um, on on terrorism generally, and you know, as as you point out, you know, many of those factors are around the world. I am actually surprised that there hasn't been more when you when you when you look at that, and 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 you know, and and I do think, particularly when it comes to um, Islamic radicalism and um, the people who, um, you know, the 9-11 the, the and related, um, r r related threats. I think the federal government has done a good job of, of uh, limiting, limiting those within the United States. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting out of my area of expertise now. But you know, I, ISIS is less of a problem now than it was. But you know, I, I don't see any sort of uh, major, uh, you know, elimination of those threats. As as for as for Trump, um, you know, it, it is worth remembering just as a background fact. Um, Upwards of 90% of the people who are indicted in federal court either plead guilty or are convicted. So um, it, it now looks like there are going to be two cases. The odds are not great. I mean, obviously, you know, the Trump cases are, to a certain extent, sui generis. But you don't want to mess with the United States Department of Justice too much. You know, I mean, this is, they do not indict cases, uh, particularly, you know, given, on, uh, given this sort of scrutiny, where the evidence is, uh, you know, am, a ambiguous. Now, um, the Florida case, the advantage to the federal government in the Florida case is that it's a relatively simple case. There's not, I mean, it's not, you know, there there are not a lot of moving parts, and the evidence seems seems fairly straightforward. The problem, very apparently, very sympathetic judge to to President Trump, jury pool in South Florida that is likely to have more sympathetic uh, judge, more sympathetic jurors, certainly an advantage. Um, what? Um, uh, it, it, you know, he's been named a target um, in the January 6th investigation. You know, I, I, in my career as a prosecutor and as a journalist, I have never heard of a, someone who was named a target who has not been subsequently indicted. So I think the odds are very strong that he's going to get indicted. That case will be in Washington, much more favorable jury pool, perhaps a more complicated case. Um, it's quite clear what the, pres the former president's strategy is, which is to get elected president of the United States. Interestingly, most defendants don't have that option. Uh, but, but this, as I say, it's a unique case. And, and his strategy is to get elected president and get arrested and get, get these cases 
dismissed because he'll be head of the Department of Justice. And, and you know, delay is, is what he's trying to do. And given, you know, how the justice system works, I think it's possible. But if any of these cases ultimately get to trial, I think Trump is in a lot of trouble. And, sir, you have the last question. I just have a comment. And, oh, and like to <laughs> all right. Answer, but it seems to me you mentioned the Internet was not there. And, but we have another ubiquitous tool for this sort of demagoguery, and that's Fox News. And Rush Limbaugh seems to me to have been the precursor to this media that seems to command such a substantial part of the country's attention. And we have these cases against Fox that are blatantly you know, uh, revealing their nature, and they don't seem to lose any of their audience. So I'm just curious if you think that there's going to be a moment when that will be addressed. Well, um, no. Uh, I don't think there's a moment when that would be addressed. I, I think what, what's happened is, you know, I, I, again, I don't want to make assumptions about this audience, but, you know, there was a time when, you know, 15 to 20 million people a night used to listen to Walter Cronkite and or Huntley Brinkley and read a prosperous, thick local newspaper that had relatively balanced coverage of, of the news of the day. The network news is, is a much smaller audience. Um, newspapers have practically disappeared um, as, 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 a, um, as, as a news source. And what we have now is a media environment where you pick the, the source of, of your news based on your previous pre political predilections. I don't see any scenario where that's going to change. I think Fox News might try to libel people less uh, <laughs> because it's costing them hundreds of millions of dollars. But they're not going to become Walter Cronkite because that's not their business model, and their business model is very successful. Um, and, 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 you know, so. You know, we, we live in a moment where the news has changed, and, and the delivery of the news has changed, and the, the way people look at the news has changed. And I don't see, I mean, that, that's determined largely by economics, and I don't think the economics are going to change anytime soon. Billion here, a billion there, soon it's real money. Yes. But before you give Jeffrey Tubin a rousing uh, thanks, but go ahead. I, <laughs> I, I just want to invite all of you to seriously consider picking up a copy of Homegrown for a few reasons. One, it is a terrific nonfiction thriller. Well, <clears throat> well researched, fun to read, I couldn't put it down. Secondly, it's an important book. It's an important book for you to read and for your friends to read. And thirdly, that Dorothy Massey is here with Collected Works and a portion <laughs> A portion of the sales will go to Global Santa Fe. Thanks again, everybody, for being here.